Okay, so here um, I want to start off talking about um, the HTML5 playback environment, you know, what the penetration of HTML5 compatible browsers are, what the codec situation is, and then I want to segue into producing H.264 and then producing WebM. So I always do a bad job anticipating what's going to appear on this screen. Um, this is from a website called Dive Into HTML5. So the URL is Dive Into HTML5. It's a very, very useful website when it comes to all things HTML5. And what this particular table is showing is codec support by browser version. Okay, so the, the vision, of course, for HTML5 is we have plug-in free playback in the browser of our video files. All right, so that's kind, of the, that's kind of the promise. That's what we all want. What we see here to kind of summarize it for you is that, you know, there's some support for Og Theora, and the only, you know, the only browser with significant penetration right now that, that still uses Og Theora is Firefox 3.5 and 3.6. So there's still probably 3 or 4% of the people out there using this browser, that if you're using HTML5 as the delivery method, you can only reach them by producing an Og Theora file. Now, H.264 is, um, is the codec that's been used by Internet Explorer 9 and Safari, and as well as being available on the iPhone and Android. But so far, it's not integrated into Opera it's still in Chrome, but Google says they're going to take it out. Of course, they said they were going to take it out last January. So January of 2011, they said, we're going to go with our industry, you know, industry standard, open source, free codec. And then they never did anything about that. So you know, I think it's a pretty safe bet that Chrome will continue to play back H.264. But you, you, you don't get Firefox. Mozilla has said they may consider H.264 because they know that they're, I think, losing market share because it's an important codec. Um, but if you're an Opera user, you may never get H.264. They're a very tiny company. It costs $5 million to integrate H.264. Mozilla can afford it. Opera probably can't. So, And then on the WebM side, WebM is the free codec that Google offered. They bought it from Antu, and they put it together with Vorbis. And, and, um, in terms of support for WebM, this, it's in Internet Explorer 9.0, but you have to download a plugin to play WebM. So it's not natively in the browser. Um, it's in Firefox 4.0 Plus. It's not in Safari, and it's not on the iPhone. So if you're trying to use one codec to deliver via HTML5, you can't do it. In fact, if you want complete penetration, over all HTML5 compatible browsers, you need to have three versions of your, of your encoded file. So that's kind of the reality of codec support as it exists today. And then, go back to my presentation. And then here's the reality of browser market share. I mean, when you, and I'm, you know, I'm not here to push Flash. I mean, you guys want HTML5, that's why you're here. But, the, the main benefit of Flash is it's got you know, 96, 97% penetration. So if you came to this conference and you said, I'm going to stop using Flash, I'm going right to HTML5, that's, you know, that's what I want to do. This is, a, this is a browser market share, I think, you know, within the last week or so. And it's from a website called netmarketshare.com. Excellent site. All this is free. Um, if you want to dig down into the numbers a little bit more, you have to pay some money. But what this shows us is the total current market share of browsers. So what we see is Internet Explorer 8, which is not HTML5 compatible, is at 27%. And we see that Internet Explorer 7 and 6 are, are at a combined 11%. So, so best case, 38% of potential viewers don't have an HTML5 compatible browser. So best case, meaning if every other browser out there is HTML5 compatible, you're going to reach 62% of target viewers via HTML5. Okay, now the mobile market is completely different. There's 100% HTML5 support in iOS devices, 100% HTML5 support in Android devices. 
But the desktop market is not there yet. And I think it's very important to recognize that this is where we are. Because if you, if you implemented an HTML5-only strategy today without fallback to Flash, you would lose at least 62% or 63% of potential, or I'm sorry, you'd lose at least 37% of potential viewers. So it's important to recognize, A, this is the universe of potential viewers and who it excludes, and then going back to the last slide, you're going to have to support two different codecs at least to get to those to get to the viewers who are HTML5 compatible. So that's that's the environment that we're working in. And this kind of summarizes it. Um, you can you know I'm assuming there's three percent not HTML5 compatible, so it's around 60, 60 to 65 percent. Um, to reach those people, you'll have to produce H.264 for Chrome, Safari, and IE9. And then if Google ever you know, delivers on their promise to, to remove H.264, you're going to have to support WebM for Chrome, and then WebM <coughs> for Firefox and Opera, and perhaps Chrome down the road. And then if you really want to go totally crazy, again, I think Firefox is around 4 to 5% at 3.6 version, you'll need OGTHEOR support. Okay, so that's kind of the setup for where HTML5 is today. Those numbers are with, from within the last week or so. Now, I, you know, I personally think there are very good reasons for producing, you know, for going HTML5 first with fallback to Flash. I just don't want anybody to think, you know, we can ignore Flash from now on because I, I think that's on, it, it's not a good strategy. So let's look at um, H.264, what it costs what the key encoding parameters are, and then how do you have to customize the file for HTML5 delivery. So H.264 um, is a codec that was jointly ad adopted by the ITU, which is kind of the video conferencing track, and then the ISO, which is the MPEG track, and then, you know, that's computers, photography, those two, uh, you know, those tracks there. And what's interesting is that in 2002, they decided to support the same codec. So they were, you know, they were developing different codecs for different uses for a number of years, and then they said in 2002, let's use the same codec for video conferencing and for, um, and for computers. So there's a tremendous amount of industry support for H.264 in the telephone, radio, TV, photography, computer, and consumer electronics. And that translates to cheap chips, right? So if you're selling millions and millions of chips for playback on small devices and consumer electronic devices, the price goes down, and that makes it very difficult for any other technology to come into the market. Um, and that's why, you know, WebM is, a, WebM is kind of a cool idea, you know, open source, free, you know, we like all that. But the reality is H.264 has been used and will continue to be used in markets far beyond the streaming video market. And, by the way, you know, it's the only codec that's been used by, you know, Adobe, Microsoft, and, and, uh, and Apple. So H.264 has tremendous momentum. Um, you know, it's not going away anytime soon, and I think most people know that. I mean, WebM was announced with wonderful fanfare, you know, probably two years ago now, and I think it's still a very small percentage of videos on the web that are not generated by YouTube. Okay, one of, the, you know, one of the reasons I think Google decided to, to bring WebM out was because two years ago or two and a half years ago when they did, there was still a chance that there would be a royalty for H.264 for delivering free Internet content with H.264. And then what happened after Google launched WebM is that the MPEG committee who controls licensing for H.264 basically came out and said, there'll never be a royalty for free Internet delivery for H.264 video. So if you're delivering free Internet video, there's never going to be a royalty. On the other hand, if you're delivering for subscription or pay-per-view, there may be a royalty obligation. And that may go back, you know, several years because that royalty obligation has always been in place. So if you're delivering under those profit models, it's a very good reason to start looking at WebM. Of course, WebM can't get you on iDevices. Can't get you on, or can't get you on Android devices. So you're kind of stuck. If you want to reach everybody out there, and mobile is becoming increasingly important to all video producers, you almost have to support H.264 because iDevices don't play WebM. And, you know, I, I put this up here. 
just to kind of highlight the point as to why Opera, very small company, you know, very good browser, they may never be able to support H.264. You know, Mozilla, their revenue, last time I looked, was in the 80 to 100 million range. They can afford it. They're a very profitable nonprofit organization. Um, and we may see them adopt H.264 in the next, you know, they said they're thinking about it, but they haven't, you know, reached a conclusion that I've seen. Okay, what is an H.264 file? I mean, basically, there are, there are compression technologies and there are container formats. Okay, so you can encode a file in H.264 and then put it in an MP4 container format or wrapper, and that's the, that's the standard format for the MPEG-4 specification. You can put it in an MOV file, which we all know is a QuickTime file. You can put it in an F4V container format, which is H.264 for Flash, you can even put it in an MPEG file. So I just want you guys to be thinking that compression technologies are different than container formats, right? So you encode your video into H.264 format, and then you put it into whatever container format is necessary to play in your target player, right? So if you're encoding for Flash, you encode into H.264 format, but you, you put it in the F4V container format. If you're encoding for HTML5, I recommend encoding with H.264 and making sure it's in the MPEG-4 container format, okay? And we'll, we'll cover that again. I just wanted to make the point here. Compression technologies are different than container formats. We encode our file with a codec, and then we save it into a container format. So what do you need to know to produce H.264 video. You need to know about profiles and levels, entropy encoding, and I and B P frame settings. Now there's a lot more, you know, books have been written about H.264 encoding. There are three hour seminars on H.264 encoding, but every H.264 encoder is going to give you access to at least the first, you know, profiles and levels. And the profiles and levels, most importantly, is how you determine compatibility with your target viewers. If you screw up profiles and levels, it's not going to play on the devices that you're targeting. So it's absolutely essential to know the impact of that. So what is a profile? A profile, and this is from Wikipedia, and it's a set of coding tools or algorithms that can be used to generate a bitstream, right? So on the left, we see I and P slices, we see B slices, and you know, we see all these techniques on the left, and we see that you can use these four in the baseline profile, these six or seven for main, and even more for the high profile. So if you were looking at this chart, you would immediately make the assumption, you know, which profile will give you the best quality? What do we think? We would think the high profile would give us the best quality. What's the downside of the high profile? What would we assume about that? Pardon? No, not file size. What? Not many devices will support it because all those algorithms make the file harder to play back. So the reason the MPEG-4 committee created profiles was so that could standardize on levels of H.264 playback that would play back on devices like this. So basically, if I'm a manufacturer like Apple, I say, I want H.264 on my iPhone. And let's assume this is an earlier iPhone. But I can't really afford to put a really big chip. It's going to burn too much power. It's going to cost too much if I put a really big CPU in there. So I'm going to use a low-power CPU that will only play video encoded using the baseline profile. And then if I'm a video producer and I want to get video on my iPhone or on all the target iPhones out there, I know I need to produce video using the baseline profile, otherwise it's not going to play. So high level messages, know the target profile that's supported by the, the target devices that you're, you're trying to get your video to. And then levels just kind of take that one step further. Levels define bit rates and resolutions within a profile. And all these charts are available on Wikipedia. The key point is, you know, as I said, profiles and levels exist so manufacturers can build devices with varying power to support H.264 at different levels. 
Now, if you're producing for HTML5 only, you can forget about profiles and levels because all browsers support baseline, main, and high up to at least 1080p. So you don't have to worry about profiles or levels at all if you're producing for the computer. Where you have to worry about it a lot is when you're producing for computers and iDevice playback or Android playback. Okay, so you know, starting about three or four years ago, everybody started thinking, well, gosh, I know I want to, I know I want to get playback on computers, but I also want to get playback on mobile devices. Wouldn't it be great if I could create one set of files that plays everywhere? You know, it's really easy to say, okay, I want to produce for iDevices, I want to support the first generation iPhones, so I'll just produce video using the baseline profile. And then I'll produce a whole different set of videos for Flash or for Silverlight on the computer desktop. But I think most producers are moving more towards, I want to produce one set of files that I can send to every target viewer. So the general rule, you know, if all you care about is computers, then produce using the high profile. If you care about computers and mobile devices, you've got to produce to the lowest common denominator. So again, if you're producing for computers and the iPhone, the first generation iPhone, you're limited to baseline profile. So the big question, you know, it's an interesting question. So you're thinking, okay, well, high profile for computers, baseline for mobile devices, how much difference is there? Should I have a two-file strategy? And I had a client within the last six weeks ask me that question. They said, I want to create a file that I can play on mobile devices and I can also play on computers. I, want to, I don't want to encode twice. I just want one file. What do I lose if I produce a file using the baseline profile and use that for both. And it was an interesting question because three or four years ago when I started looking at H.264 and teaching courses in it, I did a lot of comparisons and the difference between the baseline profile and the main profile and the high profile was very dramatic. And I did those tests again and, and this, is a, this was a different client. It's Paintbox Art, they're a big art company, hundreds of thousands of videos streamed in the UK. It's a real production file, so it's not a test file. And I said, okay, let me encode to approximately the parameters used by CNN using the high profile and the baseline profile, and then let's see who can tell the difference. Okay? Now, you would think there would be a dramatic, striking difference between the two, but let's take a look. And this is available... Um, This is available at deseo.com, rethink2, and this, the URL is on the, on the PDF file. So here's video one. Can we shut the lights for a second? And can we do that? It's still able to be controlled and it's going to stay. It's spreading slightly here and there, um, but it's able to be controlled a lot better than you can here. Having said that, you can see already that that might produce a very nice misty effect if you're doing flowers, a flower portrait for example, and you wanted a pale wet in wet background uh, colour that was sort of fairly undefined, but just su supporting the focal point of the flower. So One colour paints and, a, and a medium wash. It's still able to be controlled and it's going to stay. It's spreading slightly okay, here so and that's, there. That's um, video one. Um, but it's able to be... And let's go to video two. And let me get that full screen. Now, I'm often asked, what is a watery wash, or what's considered to be a watery wash, what's considered to be a strong wash in watercolour paints, and a medium wash? It's still able to be controlled, and it's going to stay. It's spreading slightly here and there, um, but 
it's able to be controlled a lot better than you can here. Okay. Having said so, that, anybody have any observations? You can turn the lights on again. Anybody have any? Who thinks video one is the high profile? Who thinks video two is the high profile? Okay, so video one is the high profile. Video two is the baseline profile. If you scroll down further on the page, you can see this is, so this is, and I wanted to use a production video because I thought it was most relevant to do this video, not with a test file, but with the video that's actually being used. Um, so this is the video file at CNN type encoding parameters. This is the file encoding, and I also wanted to use different, um, different encoding tools. So I did these both with Squeeze because he uses Squeeze. And then this is the actual encoding parameters that are used by this producer. So it's 848 by 40 at 356 kilobits per second, which is extraordinarily low for a video of that resolution. At this resolution, Apple publishes at around 2 megabits a second. But because he shot very well and because it's a very compression-friendly um, setup, we got very, very good quality at this data rate. And this is what he uses to distribute his video today. And you can check out, the, you know, I won't show these video files. I mean, the overall point is, whichever one you want to choose, there's not a huge amount of difference, right? So it's, you can't say, oh my goodness, I absolutely have to produce my file using the high profile, because if I don't, people will think it looks ugly compared to other files produced with the high profile. And so you can go to this web page here. I wrote about this on my own website at streaminglearningcenter.com. This is where I compared, um, I compared different files from different encoding tools. This is my test file. So this is a file produced at 640 by 480, 29.97 frames per second. And the bits per pixel is about 0 0.05. And we'll see what bits per pixel means in a second. But we see the baseline profile on the left, high profile on the right. Can we cut the lights again, please? And again, you can see this much better if you download the presentation. Obviously, it's going to look more clear on a, on a PDF. But we're not, this is a very, very, um, it, it's kind of a bellwether frame in my test file because it, it combines the end of a very high motion sequence. This guy is doing a, a flip with his, um, with his skateboard, but there's a lot of detail. So you can really see when the codec isn't doing a great job, and we're seeing you know, it's high profile on the right, baseline profile on the left, and they're, they're almost indistinguishable, right? So, and then here's another example using different encoding parameters. And here we see baseline, main, and high. Again, there's just very little difference between these clips. Now, this was the most aggressive comparison that I did. This is 640 by 360 at 240 kilobits per second. And you do see a significant amount of difference here and here, you know, with the detail in the window. So again, this is a high motion shot. We're panning across the stage. Um, and this is the only comparison that I did where I saw a substantial difference. Again, it's a very aggressive encoding, very low data rate for that resolution. And we did see a difference there that, you know, you might in this configuration say, okay, for computers, I want to do high profile. For devices, I'll do baseline profile because there, there may be enough difference there to justify doing two files. Um, So, I mean, from my perspective, you know, the, let me turn the lights on again. Um, from my perspective, what creates the quality in an encoded file? What are the parameters that really matter? We just saw that the high profile and main profile and baseline profile doesn't yield that big a difference. From my perspective, the first thing is get the configuration right, meaning get the resolution correct, the data rate correct, and then once you have that, you're probably 75% of the way there. I mean, most of the customers who send me ugly video files, they're ugly because the data rate's unreasonably low, right? So it's like, <laughs> raise your data rate $300, please. Um, just kidding. But I mean, that's, you know, that's the thing. I mean, most people just hose the configuration, and, and that's why their video files just don't look good. Once you get the configuration right, you've got to choose the right codec, and H.264 is the right codec, and WebM's the right codec, too. I mean, they're very, very close in terms of quality. Choose the right codec and encoding tool. So, I mean, X.264 gives you better quality than main concept, which gives you better quality than Apple. And then I think you've got maybe 3 to 
associated with the baseline profile, the main high profile, you know, all that stuff, you know, uh, search parameters. That's, you know, you're dealing with the last 5%. If you hose the configuration, nothing you do is going to change the overall quality of your video. And the other point is, is that as the data rate gets higher, the relevance of tweaking goes down. So Apple produces their, their web videos for the, all, the, all the products that they, that they sell at 2 megabits per second at 848 by 480. So we just saw that Paintbox Art is using 356 kilobits per second. So Apple is producing their files at um, almost five or six times higher on a bits per pixel basis. Okay? So Apple's encoding tool, you know, it, the, the, the Apple codec is subpar, and the Apple compressor doesn't access the high profile. Okay? It, it, it's topped out at the main profile. But at 2 megabits per second for 848 by 480, there's no difference because the data rate's so high, you just can't see it. So if you're really going for the lowest possible data rate, you need to worry about things like profile and, and a lot of the intricacies of the H.264 encoding. But if you're in the, and we're going to look at bits per pixel in a second, but if you're in the 0.1 to 0.2 bits per pixel per frame, you don't have to worry about, you know, I think it's get your configuration right and then everything else will fall into place. Now, we're going to talk about key and B-frame interval in a second. I think those are important irrespective of profile. If you get these wrong, you can make an ugly file. If you're encoding only for com computer playback, that's all you care about, I would use the high profile. If you're producing for computer and mobile, I would check your encoding tool. All I would do is I'd create one, one setup or one preset for the high profile, one for the baseline profile, put them side by side, and see if you can tell a difference. And you know, if you can't tell a difference, then maybe you need to think about encoding separately. If you can't, then don't worry about it. Again, focus heavily on finding the best configuration for your video. You know, don't mess up the deinterlacing, the aspect ratio, and bitrate controls. And, um, you know, after you get all this stuff right, you've got maybe between 1, one to 5% of quality to mess with on H.264 encoding parameters. Okay, so I'm basically saying get the configuration right. What do you need to understand to do that? So what you need to understand is the bits per pixel. And let's look at an example. So this is a file produced by Accenture. So, you know, we see it's pretty small. Bobby looks pretty My name's good. Julie Adams, and I lead um, Accenture's energy research we team. We the full screen. And it's going to look each pixelated. quarter, we produce an update on energy trends. You know, because we're at full screen. The main trends we're seeing in the energy industry. Right, so that's Accenture. Um, are around. And this is Deloitte. It's time for insights. A video news production of Deloitte LLP. So we see this now one's a little bit bigger. Sean O'Grady. But we also see pixelation here. Hello and welcome to Insights. Today we're checking in on the we world see a way too happy guy here. And what opportunities it may hold for investors and lenders. So the question the is, York, you know, Chicago, which consulting Chicago, firm are you going to use? Which firm are you going to take consulting advice from? Um, Accenture or Deloitte? So if we, tough to tell looking at the videos. Here's the video parameters. We see that Accenture produced at 322, 180 at a data rate of 1,500 kilobits per second, which seems pretty high, right? A pretty small file, pretty high data rate. And then we see that Deloitte was at 720 by 392 at a megabit per second. Still pretty high. Um, and then you're still thinking, well, gosh, how do they really compare? And then if you throw in bits per pixel, you see that Accenture is producing a bits per pixel of 868, of 0.868, and Deloitte is producing a bits per pixel of 0.127. So what is bits per pixel? It's how much data is allocated to each pixel in the frame. Okay. So if I tell you that CNN produces at around 0.1 to 0.12 bits per pixel, you can look at this and say, well, Deloitte's pretty close to having it right, and Accenture is just way too high. 
Okay, so bits per pixel are a very, it's a very effective metric for comparing videos produced in different resolutions and different rate data rates. And then if you, you know, how do you get bits per pixel? There's a tool called Media Info. Who has Media Info here? I mean, it's a free tool. You can download it here. It's available for Mac, Windows, Linux, and it will give you the bits per pixel of any video file that you analyze. Okay, so it's a very convenient tool. I have it on all my computers. What are the bits per pixel va values that we, we think are appropriate? I've kind of grouped these in four classes. These are, the, these are the sub 640 by 360. This is 640 by 360. This is the next level, you know, 768 by 432, and this is 720p. Okay, so these, these are files produced within the last week by all these websites. And what we see is below 640 by 360, the average is around 0.133. So we can look at the Accenture video, and, and just by knowing that number, we can say, man, these guys are just way off. The data rate is just way high. Um, they can cut that to, you know, probably to, you know, they were at 1.5 megabits per second. They can probably cut that to 300 kilobits per second, and it will look identical to what they're producing with now. And then we see that, you know, the average here for these websites is around the 0.159, and then we see it gets smaller here, and it gets smaller here. So the rule of thumb for me is that in the 640 by 480 or 640 by 360 range, anything between 0.1 and 0.2 is probably correct. ESPN, very high motion video, they're at 0.203. So that's, I mean, you know, they've got sports, right? So anything above 0.2, it, unless your video is exceptionally high motion, is going to be too high. If you're doing talking heads, CNN, they're in the, the 0.12 range. So if you're doing seminar videos, you're doing interview videos, this is a more appropriate number. And then as the videos get larger, codecs get more efficient, you can get the same quality with a lower bits per pixel value. So here we see 0.159. Here we see 0.134. Here we see 0.056. This video doesn't look any worse than these videos. It's just at larger resolutions, both H.264 and WebM gets more efficient, so you can encode to a lower bits per pixel and get equivalent quality. And then in business, you know, again, if we were looking at, and not to beat up on Accenture, these were just two videos that I found. Um, you know, a lot of the consulting firms just get it wrong, right? I mean, if CNN is at 0.12 and they're doing news videos, you probably don't need these data rates to get equivalent quality. And then, you know, Deloitte, here's the Apple video. Um, you know, the video that I produced for the Paintbox Art client was at, you know, same resolution, 848 by 480 at 356 kilobits per second. Apple is at, you know, 2 megabits per second. Um, I think that's too high, but, you know, they're obviously Apple is projecting an image, and they want absolute top quality, and I think they're using their own encoding tool, which is just subpar. <coughs> and then Intel, we see, you know, these, these ranges look pretty reasonable to me. In the, in the 720p range, at 720p, YouTube is around 2 megabits a second. Okay, so Intel is pretty aggressive here. The, the video looks pretty good. At 848 by 480, they're, you know, they're about half the data rate as Apple, and they're still getting good quality. So when, we, when I talk about getting the configuration right up front, this is the number that I focus on. And, you know, it's what I recommend. Everybody, everybody knows about every file they produce. Here's the general rules that I use, you know, that are based on what CNN and ESPN are doing because they encode a whole lot more videos than I do. Um, and just understand that as the videos get larger, codecs get more efficient, you can use a lower bits per pixel value. Okay, and this is pretty obvious. You know, if, if, the, if the bits per, this is what I see from a lot of my consulting clients, the bits per pixel value is just too low. You know, if it's around, if the video is very high motion and you're playing in the 0.02 to 0.03, the video is going to look ugly. That's just a function of how compression works. If it's too high, like the Accenture video, you're wasting bandwidth. If you're paying for bandwidth, you're not only increasing your cost, you're potentially making the video hard for some people on mobile connections to see because the data rate's so high. Okay, so that's, that's how you get the configuration right. 
for H.264 video. So that, now the other parameter that you need to know a little bit about when producing for H.264 is the whole I, B, and P frame thing. Um, and, and these are the frames that comprise an H.264 encoded file. So we have three frame types. One is I-frame, one is P-frame, and one is B-frame. So this is, um, this is an I-frame here. And an I-frame is encoded totally self-referentially. It doesn't look at any other file to, to encode that file. A P-frame can look backwards. So this is a P-frame. It can look backwards to preceding I-frames or P-frames. So this P-frame could look for redundancies with this P frame and with this I frame. And then a B frame can look forward and backwards for redundancies. Okay? So what do we know? What is the least efficient frame from a compression standpoint? The I frame. The I frames are the biggest frames. So we know intuitively we want as few I frames as possible because these are the least, you know, we want high quality at low data rates. I frames are inefficient. We want as few of those as possible. What frame is the most efficient? B frames, because B frames can look forward and back for, for redundancies. So intuitively, we know as few I frames as possible, as many B frames as possible. Now, B frames are not used in the baseline profile. We saw the differences between the, the, main, the, uh, the baseline and the advanced profile, very little quality difference. So I don't want to overstate the benefit of B frames. Um, but you know, in, in uh, that's how they operate. So what do you need to know about keyframes? You know, if you're, if you're at dinner tonight and your spouse asks, what did you learn in that seminar about keyframes? The, the only thing you need to know is that you want one keyframe every 10 seconds or so because playback always has to start on a keyframe. So if I, I have a viewer drags the mouse over to this frame and wants to start playback, where does the video playback have to start? The video playback has to go all the way back to here because that's the first complete frame. And then it's got to play all these frames to get to this frame, and then it can display it. So you want regular keyframes in the file so that you can have some measure of interactivity. Okay, you want, you want people to be able to scroll through the video and have playback to start pretty promptly. The number I recommend is around 10 seconds. And then you also want iframes at scene changes. So if I, if I change the camera angle here, it would be lovely to have a high quality frame here so that all subsequent frames that refer to that frame get the best quality. So when your spouse asks today, basically all you have to say is you want one keyframe every 10 seconds or so, and you want to enable keyframes at scene changes. Okay? And then this is Sorensen Squeeze. They make it very simple. They say keyframes and scene changes. The, the, the terminology that um, Episode uses is natural keyframes. Okay, so different encoding tools are going to express that differently. You just need to know, you know how, to, how to generate keyframes at, at, um, at scene changes. In terms of B-frame controls, when B-frames are available, um, I recommend an interval of three B frames, and that gives you a cadence of, you know, I frame, then three B frames, then a P frame, then three more P frames. Okay, so when you say an, uh, the number of B frames, that's how it works. And then how many frames do you want your B frame to refer to? I use a maximum of five. Very technical settings, you know, I don't think you're, these are just what I recommend, and, and they seem to have worked pretty well. I think you could experiment I've done a lot of experiments looking at the difference between one and five or even one and three. You just don't see a lot of difference. So it's, sometimes it's useful to just pick a number and go with it rather than you know, spend a lot of time trying to tweak and seeing if it makes a difference. Okay, beyond this, you know, the, the H.264 encoding options will vary greatly among the tools. If you understand the profile and the configuration and all that stuff, you'll, you'll be 95% of the way there. Um, Apple compressor, if you're targeting the lowest possible data rate and the highest possible quality, is a bad choice. Okay, it's not dramatically different. I think they've improved the codec a little bit, but it's just not going to give you the quality you can get from a squeeze or an episode or an Adobe Media Encoder. Um, in terms of 
you know, the thing about H.264, because it's a standard, there are different developers who produce their own H.264 codecs. The X.264 codec is an open source codec. That's the best quality that I've seen. Main concept is second, and then, um, you know, Apple falls behind that. So know the H.264 codec used by your encoding tool. Squeeze has gone to X.264. Episode is going there. They're there with their command line. They'll get there with their GUI. And we're seeing a, lot, a big movement away from, from main concept because I think the, the quality is just not as good as X.264. Um, some tutorials I've done that are available online. You've got, you know, here's the URLs. The, the one, if you want to review what we talked about today, you know, the key parameters for a profile. This is about two years old, and you'll see in those videos big differences between baseline and, prof, you know, and advanced and B frames. And, but, but those differences have gone away. I'm not really sure as to why, but, um, but, but they, uh, they've gone away. So here's our pithy summary. Um, if you're producing H.264 files for HTML5 delivery, use the MPEG-4 container format. Produce MP4 files. If you produce an MOV file, the browser may think, hey, that's a QuickTime file. I'll load the QuickTime player. Or if you produce an F4V file, it might think, well, gosh, it's a Flash file. Let me, let me load the Flash player. And then if you're producing for computer only, high profile, CABAC enabled, um, and then the B frame and reference frame we talked about. Computer and iDevice, you know, you've got to produce a file playable on the lowest common denominator. I think at this point you really have to consider just using baseline for both mobile and for desktop because I think, I think you get nearly equivalent quality with, with a lot less hassle. Okay, what is WebM? It's the video, the VP8 codec purchased from Onto. VP8 is the big brother of the VP6 codec. VP6 was probably one of the most successful codecs in history. Um, you know, really, really helped Flash come to the forefront. Um, it's open source, royalty free. That's what we like about it, right? No, no royalties, um, irrespective of how you're distributing it. Browser support, it's native in Chrome, Opera, and Firefox via plugins, Internet Explorer, and Safari. As far as I know, it's not playable on iDevices. Now, I think, I think WebM, you know, I've done very extensive quality comparisons between WebM and VP8. The quality is very, very good. It, it comes very close to what you can get with H.264, if, if not matching it. The big issue with WebM is just where can you play it. You know, it's a great codec, but it's just not playable where you, in as many places as you want. A lot of encoding tools. I looked at three of them for a streaming media review. You can read at that URL. Um, all of the free kind of website-ish tools that you can download or, or encode online, none of them worked sufficiently for, for actual production, right? So Miro, you couldn't, um, you couldn't create presets. You just had to use the two or three presets they had. That's not going to work. Firefog, you can't specify a, a target resolution. And Wildform produced files that were so bad that after I published the review, they withdrew the, they withdrew the product from the market. So if you're going to produce for production, you have three viable approaches. You've got command line. We'll show you where that is in a few minutes. You've got Sorensen Squeeze, and you've got Telestream Episode. So WebM quality, you know, this is, again, the benchmark frame that I use a lot. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of difference in quality between episode and squeeze. I think I'm pretty comfortable saying same quality. Um, how quickly did they encode? You know, encoding a six minute file to 500 kilobits per second on a 12 core HP Z800. Squeeze took five minutes and 17 seconds. Episode took 12 minutes and 19 seconds. So squeeze is over twice as fast. Um, squeeze also gives you a whole lot more control over WebM encoding parameters. Some would argue control doesn't matter so much as long as you're getting equivalent quality. But if you're in a specialized environment and you need extensive tweaking controls over 
over WebM squeezes your, squeezes your tool. So this is version 8.5. It's brand new. And here are the VP8 controls that you get for configuring your VP8 file. Um, with episode, you get literally zero WebM-related encoding controls. Some people might think, well, who cares? It delivers equivalent quality. I mean, that's kind of how I feel. But in some situations, you may need to tweak. And if you need to tweak, you get a whole lot more control with Sorensen. So, I mean, if you're, if you're going into production mode for WebM, you're looking for a desktop tool, I think Squeeze is the best choice. Squeeze Server, I think, is probably the best enterprise choice because it uses the same preset as Squeeze, and it's a, it's a higher, you know, it's, it's a higher performer. So if you're looking for enterprise-wide encoding, I would go with Squeeze Server. Um, episode Engine, you know, it's going to produce the equivalent quality files, but you know, the speed's just not going to be there. The control's not going to be there. There are multiple command line options you can, you can access at webmproject.org. Um, I will say that what Squeeze did when they came up with this interface is they basically made sure that they mapped all of the command line options into a GUI. So if you, need, you want the control that the, that the command line gives you, um, you can get that in Squeeze in a, in, a, in a graphical user interface. Obviously, you have to spend you know seven ninety nine to get it with Squeeze, but uh, you know life's too short sometimes to work with command line encoding. And then there's not a whole lot of live options in the uh, in the WebM world, but here are here are some of them. As far as I know, none of the majors have an M, M, a WebM encoding tool for live production. And then adaptive streaming, we're not really going to cover. Um, obviously, a lot of options available for H.264. Um, not so much for Dash. I'm sorry, for, for WebM. And I quickly wanted to cover Dash. I mean, adaptive streaming, as we all know, is you create multiple files, um, distribute them adoptively to your client. So if they're on a high bandwidth connection with a powerful computer, you send them a really big file, a 720p file. If they're on a mobile device, you send them a low-quality file that's lower bandwidth. Um, what we all want is you know, one adaptive streaming technology that would let us reach desktops and mobile devices, and that's kind of the promise of Dash. So Dash is a standard that's currently being implemented, um, and it supports multiple codecs, container formats, and manifest file formats. So, so this is really technical stuff, and I'm kind of like really dumping you guys into this really technical area. I guess what I'm trying to... Who here has heard of Dash? Okay, so I want, I just kind of want to show my perspective of that. I want to describe how it works. The high level promise of Dash is one adaptive streaming technology for mobile that works on the desktop. So that's what we all want. And I'm not going to get into how it works and all the details of that. I'm just going to talk about some of the realities that may limit achieving that promise. So we talked about the codec issue up front. We talked about the fact that there's, you know, a, there's only 63% HTML5 compatible browser support, and B, that's fractured between WebM support and H.264 support. So WebM, I'm sorry, Dash doesn't do anything to solve the codec issue. It supports either um, H.264 or WebM, but it doesn't specify one, so you're, you're, you may be in a situation where you have to produce two sets of files for Dash, one to reach Mozilla and Opera, the other to reach Safari and, and Internet Explorer. Um, there's also two approaches for how they fragment the files. There's MPEG-2 transport stream approach, which is kind of what Apple does today, and there's the fragmented MPEG-4 approach that Adobe and Microsoft promote. So a lot hinges on what Apple does. So if Apple says, well, we're going to support Dash, but we're only going to use the MPEG-2 transport stream because that's what we use already, then... And Adobe says, well, we're going to support Dash in the Flash Player, but we're only going to support the fragmented MPEG-4 format, then again, you're left with having to produce two sets of files and two sets of container formats to reach the two target markets. And then, you know, here's what we, you know, here's what we know 
you know, Adobe says they're, they're committed to Dash support. They're going to put it in the Flash player, but we don't know when. They're also saying we're not dropping their own proprietary technology. They're not dropping HTTP dynamic streaming. Microsoft, I think, is the biggest proponent of Dash. I think they want to get out of the Silverlight business, the smooth streaming business. Um, so I, I think Microsoft will go whole, whole, as quickly as they can into, into um, Dash support. But again, they're probably going to support the fragmented MPEG-4 approach, not the MPEG-2 approach, because that's what they support today. Apple hasn't said what they're going to do. Um, and even if they supported Dash tomorrow, you know, what's that going to mean for the current installed base of devices? Is it going to be retroactive? Is it going to work with this? Which is going to work with this? We don't know. And same thing for Google. So Google hasn't said they're going to support Dash and Android. They support HLS, which is the Apple technology. So the bottom line is that you know, Dash sounds really good, but there are some critical issues that need to be resolved before it can end up being a panacea. What we want is one set of files that can serve multiple targets, mobile and desktop, and Dash is really far away from being able to deliver that today. I mean, it, things could change next week, but as it stands today, it's just not, it's just not there. The obligatory pitch for the book. Um, and we've got some time for questions. Let me do them one at a time because I've got to repeat them. So is there a, is there a basic resolution I recommend for computer-based computer -based playback? And, you know, I think you always want to match the playback window in your browser. So if you have, you know, if you've got a 640 by 360 window, you want, you want to do 640, 360. But, you know, that number, 640, 360, is kind of the, you know, I think that's probably 50% of the web videos out there are 640, 360. So if you had to pick one, you know, I would, I would, I would do that. What was your second question? The question, second question was, you know, your, your best practices for encoding with, like, you know, uh, bits, per, bits per pixel, and et cetera, does that apply if you're using a, 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 a like, Vimeo and YouTube? Do those recommendations still apply, or they, do they not matter? Good question. So if you're uploading files for Vimeo and YouTube, what do you do? They don't matter. What I do, so what I do for Vimeo and, and YouTube is I encode the files at, like, 10 megabits a second. And then, because I know it's going to be encoded once it's uploaded. So really, when you're uploading those files there, it's really more of a, you know, how long do you want it to take? And you want the maximum quality, but you don't want to take, you know, the rest of your life to get it up there. So the number I, I never send anything higher than 720p, and the magic number I use is around 10 megabits a second. Is there any incentive for Apple to move to Dash? Um, is there any incentive for Apple to move to Dash? I mean, I would argue that there's a disincentive for them to move to Dash because they are in such a dominant position that, you know, every, every one of us, you know, if you wake up in the morning and say, I've got to support the desktop and I've got to support iDevices. So if Apple supports a standard, all of a sudden they're not in control of it anymore. They control HLS precisely. So I think they, have a, I think they would be disinclined to support it because that makes, if, if they support it the same way Android does, then all of a sudden, you know, there's no difference between the Android and the, and the, the iOS platforms when it comes to video playback. So unless, I don't, you know, Apple's a great company. I think they're ferocious in doing what's best for them, and, and that's their right. I mean, they're, they're in it for, for profit. But, you know, unless they're thinking about the greater ecosystem as a whole, which I don't think they do, um, I don't see why they would adopt Dash in the short term. They may do it tomorrow, but, you know. All right, how do I do my quality assessment? What I do, um, I tend to ignore SSIM and PSNR. And what I do, one of the reasons I love Adobe Premiere so much is that I can, so I encode my files, and Adobe Premiere can import them, and I put them on a timeline, and I put them in different quadrants if there's four files or, you know, and then I just compare frame by frame. And I've got a six-minute file I've been using for like seven years. So I know where, you know, that's why we kept seeing that skater frame. And then I play the files in real time, side by side, because, you know, you need to see the differences in quality during real time playback. Some have noisier backgrounds, and some artifacts only show up during real time playback. And that's kind of how I do it. I just, I don't believe in the, I don't believe in the statistical, sometimes they show huge differences that you can't see, and sometimes they, um, 
they don't report differences that are obvious in front of your eyes. Are there usage restrictions for X.264? Uh, not to my knowledge. I mean, I think, you know, you see an increasing number of sites using them, and you know, YouTube, I believe, uses X.264, as does Vimeo and a lot of other UGC sites. So I think now there is an X.264. So if you were, let me just tell you what I know. I know that Sorensen is licensing it from a group that they are paying money to because they wanted support, they wanted deliverable code, they wanted all that stuff. So you can, you can download x.264, put it in a command line encoding tool yourself, and I don't think you owe anybody anything. But if you want support, you want updates, then there's a group you can pay to actually get that from. And in terms of using it, um, if you use the command line open source stuff, there's no restriction. And then obviously, if you license it, whatever the licensing structure. Is X.264 available on Adobe Media Encoder? No, but um, Adobe Media Encoder is a very good tool. I mean, they, you know, the quality difference, the best main concept is compared to the best X.264 is, is very, very minor difference, and Adobe Media Encoder is a very, very competent encoding tool. The, you know, just a, a throw out for Adobe Media Encoder CS6, Adobe used to encode all files serially, one at a time, um, and with CS6, they've gone to parallel encoding for one file encoded to multiple outputs. So that's the typical adaptive streaming scenario, right? You've got one file, you want to produce nine outputs. They now do that in parallel. It's very, very fast, very efficient. What settings should you use to avoid pixelation in full screen mode? Typically what you see, companies like, or websites like MTV, they'll have, they have a video for each window size in the, um, in the browser, and then they have like a 720p video that I think only gets implemented when somebody pushes to full screen. So I think 720p is, is uh, the resolution most people, in the adaptive streaming um, grouping, I think 720p is the highest that I've seen. And I think, it's, I think it's all you need. I think you go bigger, you just, you know, it's, it, I don't think you get that much quality difference. The nice thing about going full screen, in Flash anyways, you have hardware acceleration, and that includes a lot of smoothing and other algorithms on the graphics chip itself. So 720p, I think, should be enough. Any other questions? Right, we got to wrap up. Thanks for your attention.